So War for the Overworld uh, originally started um, when a group of uh, fans of the Dungeon Keeper franchise got together on a Dungeon Keeper fan site called Keeper Clan and basically decided that they wanted a new Dungeon Keeper game or a Dungeon Keeper like game. That was a very long time ago, probably about six or seven years now, and there's been many, many iterations of the team and the project as a whole until eventually, three or so years ago, we decided that let's, you know, make our own IP and actually do this properly. And that's how this started, I guess, this iteration of the project. I am Richard Ridings, and I'm playing, I suppose I'm playing a mentor. Is, is that right, Josh? Yes. It's, it is, I'm playing the mentor. Yes, yes. He's a, he's a bit of a beast, really. He's a bit of a devil, isn't he? But he's, um, I think he's, he is subtly different in this game from the original Dungeon Keeper. Um, he's, um, he's very sardonic. <laughs> Deliciously sardonic. Um, and he kind of tells you what to do, but he, he has no qualms in letting you know when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're mucking up and you're not getting it right. So, yeah. This domain has been entirely overrun. And still, more reinforcements spill from the portal to the north. Uh, so, my name is Lee Moon, and I'm Community Manager at Subterranean Games. Well, the, the role, I mean, in our company we wear a lot of hats because we are quite small, so uh, in terms of community management, um, I interact with the community on the forums, uh, that's Steam, our official forums, uh, through Twitter, through Facebook, through Reddit, practically everywhere where we have a presence, it's me usually talking to uh, everyone we meet. Core, and I'm the 3D character artist for War of the Overworld. So after the concept artwork is complete, we uh, then go into a stage of high sculpting, high resolution sculpting, where we go from blocking out the major forms and proportions all the way through to high frequency details. And then we go for a stage of retopology, where we create the low polygon model which goes into the game, and that's optimised for performance, which means you can have like hordes of enemies all at once, under say like a, tri a 3000 triangle limit. Uh, after that's done, we then create 2D mapping coordinates where we can then add things like diffuse and text other texture maps. Um, we create normal maps and ambient occlusions, which like bake in a lot of the detail. And that gets passed to our texture artist, and then our 3D asset gets passed to the animators. Uh, the Kickstarter went really well. Um, we went in with a goal of 150,000, um, and we ended up with 211,000 on Kickstarter, and then a bit more going through PayPal. Um, we got to, I know we got to 225 because that was our goal in order to get Richard Ridings into the game. Um, and I think we got a little bit above that because we kept it going for about a month or so after. Delighted that the, 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 the original game was loved so much that, that these guys have, 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 have been hanging on to the idea of making a, a su you know, successor to, to Dungeon Keeper 2 for so long. And that we're, we are now finally in the throes of doing it. It's it's fantastic. I can't believe it actually. You know, I mean I've heard rumour through the years. But what is it? Is it nearly it's fourteen years. Fourteen years, yeah. Fourteen years. I think fifteen actually. Yeah. Yeah, fifty by the time it comes out. Yes. Yeah. So I'm Pierre Arnaud, um, and I'm known as Nano in the team. I'm working as a programmer for WFTO. We're making a very complex game, mixing so many types of games that as an overall thing, it's already something very challenging. Uh, now, if I were to sit some of the most complex things I've done for this game, probably uh, the Fog of War rendering, so the fact that you can see some time units, but then when they are in the Fog of War, they disappear, so that's mostly easy. But there are some objects that should be uh, rendered while uh, being in the grey Fog of War, so that's the part you, you barely see, so you have no direct vision to it. And that's, that's quite complex to handle. Withdraw your minions immediately. So the team uh, was entirely remote over the past uh, three years. Um, we had between 15 and 20 people working on the game at different points in time and that spread all over the UK and, and Europe. Um, we had people all over the US as well, and then we've got a, a few people in Australia, New Zealand, someone in Hong Kong, someone in Russia, really all over the place, and 
every time zone imaginable, so it's been a bit of a struggle keeping up with that. Um, recently, um, a, sort of the core of the team actually moved into a studio here in the UK. Um, we're actually in a large house that we turned into a makeshift studio, so it's almost almost like grown-ups now, but uh, it's, it's a nice middle ground between what we were doing before and a sort of a full fresh studio. And the productivity increase since moving here has been quite dramatic. It's been a very interesting but nice change. Uh, well, one of the most uh, visually significant parts of the game is a huge kind of uh, varying distance between the camp perspectives you can have from like the first person and like the huge RTS uh, perspective as well. And we've had some. Uh, it's been a, a real challenge to kind of to uh, balance the artwork in terms of detail from both perspectives without it being kind of clashing. Uh, but that's been it's been fun to kind of do that and, and sort of mean that you can look into the game and sort of see the whole kind of dungeon from a really kind of nice rich environment. And at the same time it looks silhouettes and characters really pop from a distance so you can identify stuff really easily. Well getting into into audiences for this again on this, they tend to be reasonably long sessions, so so get a cup of tea, a bit of a gargle, but most of all get your head on really and it's and the head, the head involves having, having a bit of a laugh because he's such a, a deliciously devilish character. Um, and the way we're doing it is we, we've, um, we've got Josh and the team here in the studio, but also through Skype we've got Dante and James from New Zealand and James in, in America, and everybody's feeding in and, and contributing and we're, and we're having a bit of a laugh around the world. So it's, it's a delight, it's a delightful uh, way of working actually. So the AI in skirmish mode is pretty difficult. Um, we've got a variety of difficulties and personalities. Uh, one of the personalities is called Stephen Fright, which is named after the programmer that made the AI, uh, called Stefan Fur. He's German, and the Stephen Fright personality is just hyper-efficient German, Germanly efficient at everything possible, T to a degree where if, for example, a minion needs to move from one room to another, the minion isn't allowed to walk. The AI will pick up and drop the minion before, you know, a human would even realize that that needs to happen. Literally anything that could be done to make it sort of play more efficient, this AI does. And when we clock that up and put it on the hardest difficulty, which is playing entirely within the rules of the game, it doesn't get any artificial advantages. It's literally impossible. You, there is no way a human could beat it. Um, so far, anyway. <laughs> My favourite minion. There's only one answer for that. And if anybody answers any differently, then they're completely wrong. And it is the Chunder. Certainly, I'm, I'm betting that most of my co workers are the same as the Chunder. It's probably the Chunder, because it's so ridiculous in every way imaginable. Um, to the degree where if you like slap a Chunder, it will actually fart at you. Uh, that was our audio designer actually recording them himself. It's quite amusing. Always been a bit of a Marmite creature with the community. Uh, we've got people who love him, people who hate him. Uh, almost unanimously on the development team, we love him. But it just, it's so full of character and it's just great to watch them waddling about and banging their heads on anvils to make your defense parts. Uh, it just makes my day to see them work. Yeah, I really like the behemoth just because like his sheer brutality of kind of force and uh, sort of like just, you know, aggression and stuff and I like his good he's kind of like a, a mix between like a cat and a dinosaur as well. And he almost and he's a bit of a raptor in terms of how he's kind of walking on his got hind legs and he's very scaly as well. Um, yeah so he's kind of he's a mixture of a head of a sort of a cat and then a sort of scaly kind of reptilian creature that um, with like yeah claws. <laughs> War for the Outworld is available on PC Mac and Linux online and in stores and the physical Underlord edition uh, comes with some cool art prints and will also come with the aforementioned early adopter bonus that it will be available permanently in the box. The time has come under Lord. Arise once more and prepare to begin your war for the overworld.